In this episode, we're asking you to grab some wood there, bub, and take a seat at the cool kids table as we visit with the Breakfast Club. Stay with us. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 podcast. My name is Dean, and I've got Eric with me. Hey, how you doing out there? How you doing, sir? I'm, I'm doing good. Yourself? Just capital. <laughs> Just capital. Just capital. So we are talking uh, in this episode about The Breakfast Club, which is an iconic film from the 80s. Uh, John, John uh, Hughes has got his DNA all over this, and, and John Hughes has his DNA all all over the eighties and, and part of the nineties. Oh yeah. Um, but for this one, this one came out in 1985 written and directed by John Hughes with a budget of $1 million. Mm-hmm. It made $51 million. Yep. That is money. Why wisely spent? Yes, indeed. That, that <laughs> is, is that is, that's called return on your investment. Uh, big time. Mm-hmm. Especially since they were really reluctant, studio was reluctant to have uh, to have him direct this, so he kind of cut back on some of the budgeting and and used an abandoned school and and kind of was able to to save some dollars there and it and it came back uh, it came back fifty one fold as it were. Right. So just a quick synopsis of this film: if you haven't seen it, five kids spend the day in detention. Uh, they come. They they come with predetermined notions about each other, and as they spend the the day and get into some different situations and and situ, you know scenarios, uh, they leave with an understanding mm-hmm. at the end of the day that they may have more in common than they thought with each other, mainly parent issues. Yeah. So the five the five characters the five students are are also broadly class classified as. Uh, you've got Molly Ringwald as Claire, and she's pretty much known as the, uh, you know, the 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 beauty, a snobbish beauty. You've got Rich. Anthony Michael Hall as Brian, who's like a brain, is a nerdy guy. He's a nerd. You have Emilio Estevez, who in this movie just looks like his dad. I'm sorry, he looks like Martin <laughs> Sheen. <laughs> so he, <laughs> like, yeah, he's the jock. It, it, it's weird because like sometimes I'll see movies with. With Emilio Estevez, I'm like, oh my god, it looks like his, his dad. Then I see a movie with Charlie Sheen, Charlie and I'm like, Sheen, oh my god, he right? looks like his dad. But they don't look alike. No, they're they're very distinct. They have very distinct looks, but they but, both look like their dad. Yeah, you know, it's so different. weird. Right. But I, I think I think Emilio Estevez looks more because he's got the kind of the same face as Martin Sheen, like the kind yeah, of yeah ovalish face and and the hair. You know, Charlie Sheen has like this black hair, like came from wherever. Right. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, they both independently. Re- resemble their dad, but neither one of them look like they're related to each other as brothers. So, mm. um, and then you've got, um, Alex Judd Sheen. Nelson as, as John Bender, who's like the rebel, you know, the burnout guy. Uh, and then you have Ali Sheedy as Allison, who's like a shy girl She's with, you know, kind of a weird She's clock, you know, weirdo. Yeah. The, yeah. The you know, another <clears throat> yep. kind of an outcast. So it's mm-hmm. really, really strange. So those are, those are the five, you know, young leads, um, and then you've got the great Paul Gleason as oh, the irrepressible as, as Dick as, as Dick Vern and Richard Vern and, <laughs> and and he's you know he's just one of those he's he's one of those character actors that you know and you've seen he was he was Meeks in in Trading Places and yeah. um, I think he was in Die Hard he was also Die Hard and was, yeah uh, the chief I, I love I love him in this film yeah he's this is one probably his the the, the role that he's most known for. Most He's just definitely. so like yeah. like f- full of himself and just so like swag like swaggering, but then also just made a fool of in some scenes too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but he's he's just so great. He's just so great. Um, and then there's one other guy. My, minor role is John Capellos, and he plays Carl the janitor. Um, you actually kind of see him in the in the beginning of the film. They're they're like showing you different uh, scenes from the school, and you actually see a picture of, of Carl, like when he was in high school, I guess he yeah, had done something photo. special. Yep. So they mm-hmm. had his photo up mm-hmm. and then he, he turns out being the janitor. Interestingly enough, that role was originally offered to Rick Moranis. There you go. And he uh, was actually, I, he was casted. Um, at, and, but I think he, he kind of backed out. So that's kind of, that's kind of weird. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't think I, I could see him. <laughs> I don't think I could see him playing. 
yeah. especially not then in such a small role too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's I mean, why. He was, yeah. yeah. He was like, you know, Ghostbusters and right. really doing big stuff. So that would be, that would have been like a step down or, mm-hmm. or a glorified Absolutely. cameo. Yeah. yeah. So this, this, we, so we've got a couple of things going on with this film. You've got John Hughes on one hand, and then you've got the rise of the Brat Pack, mm-hmm. which which kind of became a series of loosely uh, related related actors that had done some films together with with loosely related themes, all kind of young people and and ensemble casts where they would kind of crisscross and you know members would kind of come in, but these these five. Molly Ringwald, Emilio Estevez, Anthony Michael Hall, Jed Nelson, Ali Sheedy were, were considered like like the the brat pack. Yeah, they I think it started there. Yeah. And yeah. and then some some kind of I guess ancillary or or outside members are uh Rob Lowe, Andrew McCarthy, you know, because he had done a couple of films. So so like if you had if there was more than one of these people in a in a film, it was considered a brat pack film all of a sudden. Um, James Spader was kind of out on the periphery. Like he was like, a, I guess maybe an honorary member, but not fully in. Well, he was always the villain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, Spader in the eighties in, in his scum, in his scumbag mode, does nothing better oh. when he's just like nasty and so like snobbish and just so looking down on people. Like, mm-hmm. like I, that's when I loved James Spader was in the eighties. Absolutely. Yeah. He was just like, like in, uh, in pretty in pink and oh my God, Steph. Steph, right. So a lot of a lot of these classic characters came from like all these different films. And and most of them came came from John Hughes. Yeah. He, I mean, he he was just um just an amazing fountain of creativity. And some of it admittedly is redundant. Um mm-hmm. but let me let me start at 1983. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna go with the stuff he wrote. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. and I'm gonna st- I'm gonna stop at 1990. Okay, so that's okay. seven years. That's seven years. Okay, and every one of these I'm gonna is an pretty much an iconic film, except for one. One is uh, one I've I've heard of and seen most of, and that was is kind of like a minor one. But we're gonna start with 1983. These are movies he wrote: Mr. Mom, mm-hmm. National Lampoon's Vacation. Nate, Nate and Hayes, which was with Tommy Lee Jones. That was like a pirate movie and Michael O'Keefe. That was that's like a right. swashbuckler film. So that's, that's like right. the outlier that that does not fit with everything else. Yeah, right. Uh, after that, 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, European Vacation, Weird Science, Pretty in Pink, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, mm-hmm. Some Kind of Wonderful, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, She's Having a Baby, The Great Outdoors. Uncle Buck, Christmas Vacation, and then he tops, he leaves 1990 with like at, at the top with Home Alone. Yeah. He wrote those films in seven years. It's quite a list, quite a list. And you, when you, when you examine it, when you see it on paper or when you see it in front of you, the filmography, I, can't, I, 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 I forgot that he had wrote or directed or produced a lot of these films. And I'm like, wow, this is. Yeah. And I didn't even go into the nineties. I'll, I'll give just yeah. some highlights. Mm-hmm. Career opportunities, only the lonely curly Sue, Beethoven, mm-hmm. home alone Two, mm-hmm. baby's day out. I mean, he started to really get into the family stuff. He started, you know, he wrote 101 yeah. Dalmatians for Disney, the live action, you know, he did kind of, you know, kind of go that, that family friendly Disney route, but, 83 to 90 this guy this guy's dna was all over classic films mm-hmm. you know so it, it's just one of those guys that yeah you you think usually think the the core three or four films that he's so closely associated with 16 candles breakfast club weird science though you know those types of films um which which is in his wheelhouse obviously mm-hmm. and pretty in pink yeah mm-hmm but all those other ones, I didn't even realize. Like Great Outdoors. Not that I, I never saw the Great Outdoors, but it's one of those films that you, you know, kind of uh, associate with classic '80s films when when those comedies were big and, and people mm-hmm. would just go see those Uncle Buck and, and that kind of stuff. Planes, trains, and automobiles. I mean, that's a classic. Right. 
Then, of course, he had just the, those collaborations with certain people, too, like John Candy, who we made, you know, that was like his Bobby De Niro to Scorsese, right? His, to Scorsese. Kind of. Uh, I think he was in like maybe three or four films with him. And he yeah, took I mean, it really hard when he Molly, died. Yeah. Molly Ringwald also. <laughs> yeah. Was was one. And, and they actually kind of had a falling out. He... She wanted he wanted her to be, I think, in some kind of wonderful, and she was trying to get away from the whole teen thing, mm. and said, "I don't want to do it." And and he never really kind of forgave her for not not wanting to do it. Yeah, he he considered her his muse. Yeah. I think that's that's what it was. I mean, I, you know, I think when, in the case of the Breakfast Club, I think she wasn't even originally supposed to be cast as as Claire. Uh, I think she was uh, she. Wanted, they, he wanted her to audition for Allison, and she was like, "No, I want to play Claire." And she was adamant, so she convinced him. She convinced the studio to to get, to get it done, and 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 she did. So maybe that's why, um, you know, that relationship started to form. I don't know. Maybe he saw something in her that was like so strong and so you know so so ambitious. Um, yeah, I mean, three, fil- three films. Him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Three films and pretty much almost back to back. Like Sixteen Candles was eighty four, Breakfast yeah. Club was eighty five, Pretty in Pink was eighty six. So that's like a, you know, that's a Molly Ringwald trilogy right there. Mm-hmm. If there ever was one, right? I can't see her as Allison. There's no way. No. I, you know, it's just. <laughs> do you know? No. Do you know who they were talking about for Bender and Judd Nelson's role? Which I would. Lo- I want to see this Breakfast Club. Um, Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. Yep. Oh my God, that would be insane. I, I want to see that version of the Breakfast Club. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, I, Cage, I mean, that would be it. interesting. <laughs> forget it. He would, he would have, it would it would have been insane. It uh, would have been insane. That's true. With Cage, when I when I think of him in like Moonstruck in those early roles, uh, it would have been know, it would have been absolutely Arizona. Nuts with yeah, Cage. yeah. It would have been a totally different movie. They might not have been able to control it. That maybe that's why. And I think they didn't they cast uh, they he also he actually casted John Cusack to play Bender. Yeah, well, they, they, you couldn't get just, two more different people than that. Cusack just didn't work out because you know Cusack wasn't mean enough or tough enough or something to that effect, and um, so that's where Judd Nelson came in. Yeah, but, oddly enough, mm-hmm. Cusack and Cage would collide mm-hmm. in Con Air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they would meet and they would discuss. The fact that they lost that role to Judd Nelson. To Judd Nelson, right? But they're like, we're here now on the on the set of Con Air, so good on us because where's Judd Nelson at the time? Yep. Ooh. Yeah, he kind of after Breakfast Club, I think he made a few couple more movies, and I don't think any of them were really stand yeah. out to, to varying you know, degrees. Orange. I mean, he was in New Jack City, which was a pretty big film back yeah back in the night early nineties. Um, that was pretty big, and he was like one of the uh, one of the cops, one of the detectives. He's he's been in and out. He certainly hasn't had a, anything consistent and not anything anything big. Mm-hmm. I think really the the two survivors out of this were oddly enough Anthony Michael Hall, yeah, who kind of really really kind of made a career, went from a nerdy guy to like this big guy and and kind of a you know, Hulk, not a hulking actor, but, but not this, he didn't cash in on the skinny thing. He just started doing regular stuff. He was in the, the t- TV series, the dead zone for a while, which was which the was TV version of that. Pretty good, by the way, I actually watched a couple of seasons of that. It was, that's, it's actually a pretty decent series. Yeah. yeah. And then he was, uh, he was hung upside down by Heath Ledger in, uh, in, in dark night. <laughs> right, he was he was right. the reporter. That's the right, right. Yep, that's right. Heath Ledger and, was and you know. scissor hands. That's when he got like buff, and he was like the you know the dick boyfriend. And uh, but yeah, all of a sudden he's just he came out of nowhere with this bustling bike. Like I got ripped. Like what what the hell happened? You know, this is not Brian. <laughs> you know, he was not going to be typecast. And, no. and then I think the other one that that kind of kind of made something out of it was Emilio Estevez. Mm-hmm. Although not so much later, but he did kind of sur- he kind of surged out of that. He did use the the Breakfast Club to really kind of also do other things. I mean, he went on to direct. He did Young Guns, so he was he was definitely uh, leveraging w- what he had and the popularity that he had because he went from Breakfast Club, Saint Emil's of Fire. That was then. This is now. That's still in the teens teen stuff. But then he did that film Wisdom, which is a really not a big film. I kind of dug it. It was from 86 yeah. with him and Demi Moore. Mm-hmm. He, he wrote and directed that. So he was kind of getting out there. And then 
Young Guns, which was really big. Young Guns 2, which was really big. And then he hit like the, the Disney pay dirt with Mighty Ducks. Mm-hmm. So think what you will about that, but but that became a, a big a big thing for him. And then one of my favorite is uncredited is he was in Mission Impossible, the first one. That's right. He was in the very beginning, and it's like, That's oh my right. god, Emilio Estevez is in this. Yep. Unf- then, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, he he was the first member of the uh, IMF to not make it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he got taken out pretty quick. Right. That's because right. He was sitting on top of the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I didn't know that elevators had those things up there that come yeah. down mm-hmm. and will like pierce your, like pierce your body. I never saw that before. So I'm like, I'm never going to go on top of an elevator ever. Mm. It, it's never going to happen. So he, so he had done some stuff. It, it, so a lot of director stuff too, which is, which is good for him. You know, not as much as the acting. Um, he directed the the movie Bobby, which is about uh, Robert Kennedy, yeah. uh, in two thousand six. So he's he's been been pretty active um, in doing things. So he threw himself well into the craft behind the yeah. scenes, and yeah, writing, directing, yep, producing. Yeah, it's, yeah. <clears throat> and he and he dated he dated Paula Abdul. He was married to her for a while for two years. So um, there's that. And then we have Ali Sheedy, who, you know, again, she went on to do, you know, you see her, well, she pretty much did a lot of coming of age type stuff, you know, and then later on, she, you know, she did stuff like, you know, fun stuff like, uh, like Short Circuit. Mm-hmm. She was in the first Short Circuit movie. Um, she did War Games. This was before Breakfast Club. With Ferris Bueller. That's That's right. Yeah, with, with so, Matthew Broderick, and then you see she's more of I think I guess she became more of a character actor. You see her pop up, and I've seen her in like things like Law and Order over the years and different TV shows and such. But she never probably didn't become as big, you know, as some of the other faces and on this list. But um, but then uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the film. Let's get back into. Okay. Um, so who do you so out of these five people, okay, mm-hmm. who do you think you most related to when you first saw this film? When I first saw it, well, that's a different thing. So when I first saw the film, I saw it when it came out in '85. Yeah, and li- literally, we were in the target audience, fr- fresh out of high school. So the high school experience was still kind of fresh, fresh in in your mind and in your you know psyche and how you think about things and and all that kind of stuff. So back back then I might have maybe related to Ali Sheedy's character not mm-hmm. f- from the lies that she tell <laughs> not from the lying <laughs> yeah just from like the with, withdrawn or I felt or or maybe I, I I didn't maybe identify with her but I connected with her more I liked that character the best. Let me put it to you that way. That that character was the most compelling to me because mm-hmm. She had no reason to be there. <laughs> there was really nothing. She had no gripes for the most part. Right. Um, and she was just very strange. So that to me was very compelling is she didn't speak for, for the first half of the film. And it was just every, and everybody else in, in the film's kind of wondering like, what's her, what's her deal? What's with her? She's weird. You know, what's going on? And she's yeah. eating the, <laughs> she's eating the sandwich with the Captain Crunch on it. So uh, as a Captain Crunch fan, that, that kind of got me right there too. What yeah. about you? Uh, same. Uh, but also a little bit of Brian, I think, not so much the brainiac side of it, but the uh, just the nerd. Uh, you know, I was kind of I was a skinny kid growing up, and you know, so I, I can relate to that. And then, of course, you know, with Ali Sheedy, it was the, it was the, it was her introverted nature that really, yeah, that was compelling. And for me, um, but even even telling some of those lies. Like I remember like me as a little kid, I would make up stories to people, you know, um, just, I can't really think of anything offhand right now, but it's just, you know, but I, I would do that. I would, I would make up stories. I would act a little strange. I would, I was always in my room. I was listening to weird music. I was, you know, kind of had my head in the sand, uh, for quite some time. Um, so yeah, those those are the those two characters a little bit of combined, I think, for me. Certainly wasn't the jock. That was my brother. I mean, well, my brother was the jock and bender a little bit. <laughs> so Yeah. Um, it's I, I think I think everybody could maybe find I, I when I was thinking about it now, 
Yeah. I, I was thinking there's probably, there was probably, you know, cause hindsight, you, you get some distance and you get some perspective and you mm-hmm. get the adult in you starts to look at it. And I was probably like, you know what? There's probably aspects of all of them in, in, you know, when you, when you're able to look at it now, back then you're like, Oh, this is, you know, I feel like this and my, you know, my parents and don't, they don't get me and all that. And you, you really relate to it. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it now, I'm like, well, there's, there, I, I was on track. I did play some sports. Was I a jock? No, but there was that aspect. Yeah. Did I cut class? Absolutely. Did I get suspended? Yes. So there's an aspect of Bender there, mm-hmm. right? So there was aspects of, of, of most of these characters when you look back and, and take out, well, who do I identify with? It's kind of like, well, kind of everybody. And and that's actually was the theme is, is we're, at the end, it was the same thing. It's like, we're all this. That's the point. Yeah. You know, we're, 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 we're all this. We're not these, these narrow, uh, you know, stereotypes. Yeah. They did. They, they represented a, a, a different social class of the high school hierarchy, you know, so they come in and, you know, they're, they're supposed to be separate, but by the end of it, they do. They they have things in common, and they find this out through the through the course of the film. They, they express themselves. Each one gets a gets a, a moment to shine, so to speak, and they find things out about each other that would would never happen otherwise. Just walking down the you know the schools of the uh, the, the hallways of the school, like just looking at each other, they would never even consider being friends with that with each other. But by the yeah, end, so, of this so being put kind understanding of understanding of one another. Yeah. yeah, so kind of being put in in school jail will yeah. do that because you've got no choice. The funny thing also is in the beginning of the film when they each get dropped off, the vehicles kind of give give you some tip offs also. Signify Molly Ringwald gets gets class in yeah. a luxurious car, and then uh, Anthony Michael Hall. It's like a really just a, an economy car, and, and the, I don't know if you noticed the license plate. It's EMC two, which is Einstein's yeah. Uh, uh, equation. So I caught that. And then like, like Andy, the sport guy gets dropped off in a Bronco Bronco in, yes. in SUV. <laughs> the, that father, I didn't realize when I watched it again, he's the detective from the fugitive. That's right. You know, financially, you're not going to be hurting, are you? Doc? That's right. You know, I was yeah. like, <laughs> <Another character. laughs> like, like going in on Harrison Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Like, those, <laughs> those, two, those two detectives were like unrelenting on, they uh-huh. just wouldn't leave him alone. Like, like they had it in for Harrison Ford and, and he was one of them. He was just like, they just wanted him like no, guilty or innocent for some reason. It's like, we, we need to catch him. Yeah, that's right. Because it's going to make us look bad if he's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was, he was the dad. He was Emilio Estevez's dad. And then when I'm looking at him, I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy. And it makes sense because he's, that, the, the uh, Breakfast Club is, is a Chicago thing, Illinois, all those movies happen there. And the fugitive was the same thing. Mm-hmm. It was it was over there. So that guy's is as much as there are New York actors that Scorsese uses for his films in New York. There's there's a there's a Chicago chapter also That's right. of of those actors that were, are going to get cast in John Hughes films and and always be used and or if they're shooting up there. Um, so that was pretty neat to see him. I'm like, oh my god, that's the guy. Ron Dean is his name. Just came. Yeah. Ron Dean. Yeah, it's a great character actor. You've seen him in everything. He's in, well, a lot of cop shows. Yeah, watch a lot of, you watch know, The Fugitive of, with yeah. Harrison Ford. That's like his his best one where he's just how, like re- hounding. Right. Does, does not want to see anything but this guy guilty and in jail. And like he makes cops look bad because it's like he doesn't want to look at any other evidence. Like he's guilty. He killed his wife. That's it. Bring him in. So that was right. So, so the, cars, the cars are what kind of give you give you some tip offs and bender comes walks in with no car he walks he just from, from walks the field yep. and he's got nothing so so mm-hmm. they they are kind of setting it up and and yep. giving you some cues right away to pick up on uh, as to what what the where these these kids are coming from and they get they get in there they they sit down and and <laughs> and then paul gleason comes in as dick vernon and, and just kind of lays the law down He's got nothing but contempt for all of these kids, no matter who they are. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of like you know, you're you're gonna be here, and you know, you. I don't care. You're gonna write an essay today. We're gonna do this, right? It's and he's just were, not. He's just not having anything. Because like, they just thought, not yeah, they thought they were gonna just spend the day doing nothing. And you know, uh, Brian's mom, Anthony Michael Hall's mother, who was actually his real mom, by the way. Um, Cast yeah, she's as, like, as the do mother. something. You're gonna go, yeah, you're find gonna a way something. to do something. You're gonna find <laughs> a way to study. So you get a Work. you get a sense of what what she's all about. Yeah. Um, 
So, yeah, they, they all thought they were just going to sit there and do nothing. But, you know, Mr. Vernon had uh, something else in mind. And pretty much he come up with this idea of writing an essay, basically saying, you know, just who the hell do you think you are? You know, I want to know who you think you are. You know, so this, of course, is off-putting to the kids right off the bat. And, and most especially Mr. Bender, who starts giving them, you know, he gets the ball rolling, so to speak, as to riling everybody up and including Vernon. Oh, so yeah, there's he's this sort of a back and forth, you know, he's a punk, he's, you know, he's, he's a bully, he's, you know, he's making fun of people, he's, you know, he's doing, doing it all just to get everything up and running. So yeah, there's he's, all he's, this chaos ensues, you know, as it goes on, but yeah. He's, he's <clears> absolutely <throat> the spark for that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, and that's the thing. I, I, I do now have problems with this film. I'm going to be upfront with you. Okay. I hadn't seen it when, you know, when I saw it back in the day when I was of that age, I was like, oh my God, I, these, these, they understand me and they get it and, you know, all that stuff. I actually probably haven't seen it. I've maybe seen it once since then, although it's a beloved film of mine. I watched it again and I actually, I came away with some different feelings about it. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of like, I kind of changed some, some, some things I felt, especially when you're looking at the other films that John Hughes made. But the the bender is is definitely the catalyst he's the one that is is always propelling the story forward either by trying to get the door closed trying to to get to the locker to get the weed sneaking around it's everything that he does it compels the other castmates to follow him mm-hmm. and then there are situations that grow out of that so he definitely is for lack of a better term i mean he's the devil's advocate of this mm-hmm. But he comes off a little bit too smart. He's a little too in, in yeah. touch with everybody. He seems to know every like what what buttons to push for everybody to piss him off or or to get them he's, upset. And 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 now when I watch it, I'm like, you know, he's like a little too smart and a little too all knowing for me. Um. Yeah. I I I I could see that. But to me, that's pretty much the whole point. So you know, just because he's you know, AKA From the wrong the, side of the tracks, right? The AKA the criminal doesn't, doesn't yeah. mean that he's not intelligent, that Absolutely he's not, not able to, that he, you know, he can't pick up on these things with the, from the other kids. And that's, you know, that's why yeah, they, they both, was, they despise him and they, they look up to him in a way too. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's time. what bothered me. He was like a little too insightful and, you know, had too much of, of the truth for everybody. But then again, you know, I, I kind of like, get that vibe from Allison as well, because she's she's kind of observing everything, right? She's 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 in the background, she's quiet, she's making and but she's watching everybody. So yeah. she's kind of, you know, well hers gathering. is more of a romantic a romantic spin on things though when they're having the conversations at the end when everybody's kind of opening up. Yeah. And she tells some really severe lies about doing some sexual things and everyone's mm-hmm. shocked. And then she's like, no, it's not true. But if you love somebody, it's okay. And, and she, she has a really romanticized view of it. Of, she's very of, insightful. Of life. Yeah. Yeah. She comes yeah, so off. It's, that. And again, the intelligence is there. It's just, she doesn't have, it, she may not have the confidence or, or she just wants to be weird. Uh, we, we don't really know. But maybe that just what she needed was someone to interact with because nobody paid attention to her. To begin yeah, with. And she wanted so, to blend it. She wanted yeah. to be inconspicuous mm-hmm. and, and and dressed very inconspicuously so she would blend in and ha- had her hair very inconspicuously so people couldn't see her face. So th- yeah. those were all, all all choices that she made to kind of hide herself within within school to be invisible. But then, you know, she shows up at detention because she's got nothing better to do. She actually didn't <laughs> she actually didn't right. do anything, which was a which was kind of a, a, a tension breaker. When everybody was at, at the end, they're all kind of going through and, and having their moments of realization. And then mm-hmm. she's like, I, I, "Like, what did you do?" She goes, "I didn't do anything. I just have nothing better to do." And then, and it, you know, so that was a ni- it was a nice tension breaker because things at, at the end when they're kind of sitting after like the day is kind of coming to an end and, and all the adventures have been had and and the fights and and everything they're they're kind of reconciling everything throughout the day and they're kind of finishing out and and yeah anthony michael hall gets to tell really his story about what he did where everybody comes you know it gets gets why they're there yeah they're all yeah but and and that's another part of the problem that i had with the film when i watched it i was like it's a lot of telling and not a lot of showing 
you know, they're all, they were all telling about these things. They're all telling about how horrible their parents were. Now they don't, mm. none of their parents listen. And it was every, every character was telling basically the same thing. So after a while, I'm like, yeah, I, I get it, but you didn't, it wasn't really shown. You had, you literally had 30 seconds in the beginning of, of each, each character's intro when they got in, you know, when they're in their car and they get out and, and they really, the characters are really drawn really broadly to be, you know, like the mother is like, yeah, do something. And the, yeah. uh, Emilio Estevez's father, like you don't want to blow your ride, so so they really kind of really stereotype them. But you, but I didn't get a feeling for that because everyone had basically the same gripe is that there was parents are put, putting pressure on them, or parents aren't paying attention, or parents mm-hmm. don't love them. So for me, that kind of started to wear thin because every character basically had the same issue. There wasn't one that was like, oh yeah, no, I have a great home life, and here's here's the contrast to that, and here's you know, like there, there wasn't that balance. There wasn't something to balance it out. There wasn't that representation, and and the, funnily enough, it's the, uh, uh, when I first saw it, I was a little, I have to admit, I was a little put off by that because my home life wasn't certainly not like that. It was you know, my parents did the best they could, and I was a little off, you know, like all the, all the adults in this movie are portrayed as monsters they're, they're the way they speak to uh, about their parents yeah. and, you know it's it's kind of you know so i find that a little a little unsettling actually and and it's and you it's know? very strange when you look at the, at other john Hughes films yeah so if you look at 16 candles and the father figure who's played by paul dooley he's very caring and very supportive of Molly Ringwald's character when she's in love with somebody that doesn't know she exists. And Mm -hmm. the father's like, you know what? Well, then he's not worth your time. And then in, in pretty in pink, when you have Harry Dean Stanton as the father, who's, who's like a working man, not, doesn't have a lot, you know, could be Bender, Bender's father in another movie. Yeah. He's kind kind of, of, kind Mm -hmm. of downtrodden, but he always, he he cared for her. He cared for the, the character, Andy. So, and, and even some kind of wonderful, Mm-hmm. Which is basically a rewrite of Pretty in Pink. He he rewrote it because the the he didn't get the ending that he wanted in Pretty in Pink because they tested the original ending and and audiences didn't like it. So he rewrote the movie with swapping the characters male for female and rewriting the ending. And and I think that some kind of wonderful is a better representation. I think of like the teenage experience or what you were going through because you got the whole picture, especially in in that film. You got the friends. You got his what he was like at work. You got what he was like at school, where he was looked at as an outcast. So you saw, but you saw the different facets, and then you saw how he interacted with his parents. And his parents thought he was a brain and, and well adjusted and had no problems. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I when I think about these other films, and then I, you know, the Breakfast Club is great because it's like a therapy session. Exactly. You know, you're you're, you're in the room. It, it, it it's almost like a play. Mm-hmm. It would really be good as a as a as a stage show. Because you can have those intense moments with with the characters in in that closed environment, and that's really what the Breakfast Club was. When I saw it back then, when I was young, I was like, "Oh my god, this is so intense!" And it was so like I, I couldn't believe it. And and you know the 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 young people were just really just intense with how they felt and and the the struggles they were going through. And as someone when you're at that age, you you feel it. So the emotions rang rang high and true. There was a, there was an honesty to it, and we had never seen I don't think anything like it beforehand. I mean, there was a lot ton of movies out there where, yeah, you you do have all the different types of you know kids and you know high school, and you see nerds getting beat up. But typically, you know, it was always that oh I got you know I got to get laid kind of thing, and even the nerds were like put typecast into that role of you know like Porky's and things like that. This was a movie there where we're watching these kids and the emotions are just, it's just palpable. And, you know, that's yeah, they, to me, it's that funny was just, it just jumped off the screen. And I was, I was so taken with that, but at the same time, but at the same time thinking, you know, do I agree with this? Do I believe them? Do I, am I supposed to relate to them? It was an eye opening experience for sure. Yeah. You because know, you're absolutely right. Because yeah. there was, Though they had all the stereotypical characters, right? The you yeah. know the burnout and the, yeah, and and the the nerd, but none of them were played for laughs. I mean, the, the the movie is humorous. It's not an it's not slapstick comedy, and but there is funny stuff. But the the character they took those stereotypes and put them in 
like real world. Like, okay, if, yeah. if we had these characters and we put them into a novel th- and, yeah. and they had real world situations, this is, this is how these characters will react. So it's, it's like the nerds from weird science, but minus all that weird stuff. Mm-hmm. And when, when there's nothing left and that kid is by himself in a room with other people, what's, what's it really like? Mm-hmm. You know? So I, I think that's interesting that you kind of hit on, on the, 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 stereotypes that were there before in other movies fast times at ridgemont high and and everything that was going on with those films but and then the breakfast club comes comes along and says we're going to treat the 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 kids with respect and and kind of and john uses like i'm going to really try and get down on their level yeah and 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 kind of bring this to their level where the kids are the ones in control of of their feelings and and they're going to be in an in an uh, a situation where they can find out that other people feel the same way mm-hmm. that even though they're all so different that it's, it's not so different when you're at home. Mm-hmm. I think it was a shot in the arm for, well, teenagers everywhere. And of course, budding filmmakers who would, who would go on to make, you know, I, I think of uh, people like uh, Diablo Co- Cody, who I know was a big fan. who was a writer, you know, she's a writer of, of, of coming of age films and, um, but it it was just that stark, real like one room kind of thing where you know you you're forced to to, to deal with this stuff and, and a lot of it felt uncomfortable. I remember we we saw it like we saw we saw it actually. St- I don't know if you saw it before me, um, but we kept I know going I saw it back. more than once. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we kept going back. You and I we must have seen it at least three times. You know, yeah, it was it was intense back then. It was pretty intense because there was nothing yeah. like it because we had come from sci-fi movies yeah, and even for the, most, other- for the most part movies as kind of escapist entertainment and, you go right. see stuff to get away and and fantastic and indiana jones and and raiders and and return of the jedi and then you go see breakfast club which is about people your age at the time when we saw it we were though we were that age and about like heavy subjects it wasn't it wasn't the teen comedy it was kind mm-hmm. of the teen dramedy yeah really yeah Except for Paul Gleason, though he just kind of, I can't I can't wow. I can't get away from him because he he represented such a threat also to to the kids as, as just a this this authority figure, but also to Bender because he really has it in. We talked about you know the cop having it in for Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. Mm-hmm. Well, Gleason has it. Paul Gleason has it in for Bender in this movie. Mm-hmm. He's just he's got an axe to grind. He's just tired of. Maybe all the years teaching, they, there's a little conversation about that, about teaching, but he's just got it in for Bender. And, and there's a scene which really kind of is is pretty telling uh, and somewhat disturbing where Bender just kind of is running around the halls. He kind of sacrifices himself because the, the, they're all running around. And so since five, so five of them don't get caught, you know, Bender's going to take the sacrifice rat. himself yeah. and and run around and and divert the the other kids so they can get back to the library where their detention is so he finally gets caught and and you know he gets locked brings, a, brings him to the like the side office and is going to lock him in there and he's like not even an office is, it's like a storage closet yeah like to the like, side of the yeah it's kind of like to the side of the office yeah mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and basically basically says you know you're really not going to be anything you're not you're not anything you're a liar. And then he almost has an epiphany. He's like, you know what? Let's, let's, let's have this out right now. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Judd Nelson, but probably in one of the better scenes he has was kind of like shocked. He's like, what do you, like, what do you mean? Like, you're almost like you're a teacher. You're not ever going to hit me. And, and Paul Gleason's like, you know what? Who's going to believe you? Yeah. Like, incredible. no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm known here as a good guy. I'm People the, I'm me. the nice guy. Yeah. You're the, you're the, yep. the trash. No one's going to believe you. So, you know, I'm gonna because he kind of said what what set it off. He's like, you know, is is you're gonna leave here and you're gonna go to your life? And he goes, I'm gonna find you. I'm gonna <laughs> knock your dick in the dirt, which is one of the best lines ever in movies. You're, you're a gutless <laughs> turd, the, and the, yeah, he's just, just laying way, it on. Yeah, yeah, just the way he delivered it was just so <laughs> like like he 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 was he knew he goes, I'm I am gonna find you and I'm yeah. gonna get you. Right, and that's when Judd Nelson kind of turned like, oh, like this is extending outside of school. Like I can't, you know, I can't just come in and, and be, you know, this, this rough and tumble guy and then leave and, and not have any consequences. All of a sudden it's like, this guy's going to find me in later in life and, 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 you know, knock the crap out of me. So oh, it, it really it, it wasn't, was, that was pretty, probably one of the most intense scenes because it was a real, there was a real threat of 
of violence and Paul Gleason is is like, yeah, we're, we're going to do this. And he takes his jacket off and he's like, come on, you know, I'll give you the first shot. Take the swing, you know, tough guy. He really calls him out on, on his BS, honestly. You know, refle- really this, well, I think it reflects guy, his home life too. Yeah, and um, it reflects that. He comes from an abusive household yeah. and, and mm-hmm. you see he kind of freezes, you know, almost almost like he's shell-shocked, almost like he's, like this is a kind of something that would go on at home. So, th- so it was, that was a very powerful scene. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe very telling for for that character. Um, it, it didn't change anything about him though afterwards because he was still antagonistic to the rest of the group. Um, you know, it was just it was just kind of weird. Yeah. But but it was it was a great scene. That scene was a great scene because it because it was just so intense because it was there was real threat there. It was just the two of them. No one would know, yeah. and, and you don't know that you know the char- you know Paul Gleason's character was just building up his contempt for this guy. And what's interesting is that he doesn't reveal it he doesn't tell any of the others about it yeah you know if you notice like you know it's they all hate the guy i mean vernon you know he's pretty much a dick to all of them but and you would think that bender would be like hey you know he was but he doesn't he keeps it to himself which is i find interesting you know yeah, so it might have been so fr- it might have been so frightening that he didn't yeah, want to share that right you know i think that's what it mm-hmm. was it was so it was you know a little he had that like, like that traumatized look like oh, oh my god i can't believe this is happening or yeah. You know, yeah, and, and add, you know, I'm I'm tough with people my age, but I can't hold my own, you know, because I come from an abusive home or whatever it was. I, you know, I want to go too far in speculating that, but it was it was pretty powerfully written, mm-hmm. um, and and just acted out because it was just the two of them, and there was no, wasn't played for comedic, uh, you know, hits or anything like that, or no comedic beats in the script. It was just kind of this is this is happening here, and 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 then they kind of just let that sit. And, and then you uh, and then and you see, and then you see a little bit more from the character, right? You see him actually when they're at this point, he's like he's had it with them. Like he he doesn't even bother to keep to check on them. Like the like later in the afternoon, he just decides he's going to take a little stroll yeah, down to the archive done. room, <laughs> and he's going through people's files. So you really you really get a real sense of this of this guy. Oh yeah, he's doing he's doing his dirty work. He's doing yeah. his research on it. Yeah. Oh, he's like looking through the file. Like oh, that's very interesting. He's all oh, that. Well, no cool. wonder he's so fucked up. You know, like yeah. <laughs> and then of course the uh, the janitor comes yep. in and he catches comes him in, in there. The what you doing there? What yeah. you doing there, Dick? You know, because the janitor knows everything. That's one of the one of the pearls of wisdom is, you know, the janitor because they're because they're making even the, the students are making fun of the janitor. And he's like, you know, I see everything. I see your garbage. I look through it. I know your secrets. I know everything about you. Kind of, you know, they were turning their nose that it was probably the only adult they felt that they could probably, you know. Yeah, be better than because he was one and of like them. like who's yeah. who's who's lower than the janitor. And he's like, oh, just you know, be careful. I I'm I see all. I know all. And he doesn't you know, have a problem of, with who he is. Like he's, you know, he yeah. is who he is. He's he's dealing with it, you know, living his life, you know. So he's like sitting there with with Vernon, and you know, and you, then you see that Tender side of Vernon come out, and then you get then you start getting some real like stuff coming out of Vernon. Like he yeah. starts he starts like spilling his guts about what's what he re- how he really feels, and so there's a little bit of. So, you, you, you know, in a way, you can't help but feel just a little bit sorry for the guy because he probably put up with a lot of crap over the years from kids, teaching kids. And he's just he's built this sort of like disdain for kids. And he thinks that they're all troublemakers. And, you know, yeah. and, and the they're, get, guys they're like, getting worse. Like, that was the thing is they're getting yeah. worse. They weren't like this. And then and right. then, but Carl, Carl, again, gives another pearl of wisdom. He's like, oh, mm-hmm. you thought you were going to have summers off. You thought this was going to be so easy. Like he kind of yeah. kind of guessed. Like oh, you became a teacher because you're you're kind of taking an easy way out, and now yeah. that it's work, and these kids are are, are a challenge. It, it's the kids' fault. Yeah, you know these these kids keep changing. They're you know they're getting worse and worse, and everybody every generation says that, and we we say that, and our parents said it about us. <laughs> so it, 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 yeah. there are some there are some there are some truths that that are in this movie, mm-hmm. um, and and they do. The 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 kids do hit on it at the end, and they kind of, um, you know, are we going to become our parents? Are, are we going to be like this? Is this is how we're going to be? And and mm. you know, I forget who who definitively says no, Claire, or something like no, never. You know, it's like, well, I, I'd like to see. I would have liked to have seen John Hughes try and like if he was with us, he passed away. Um, to take a crack at, at, I would like to see him take a crack at, at another Breakfast Club and another another Ferris Bueller. 
<laughs> I always wanted to see like Ferris Bueller 30 years in the future mm-hmm. and what he was like. And it would have been interesting to revisit these characters that after they've had kids or not had kids or, or gotten into careers that, that yeah, life, life happens to you. And, and Ali Sheedy, her character says something really though. It's kind of like, it's inevitable when you get old, like your heart dies, which is pretty, that's pretty brutal. I agree. <laughs> that's a, I that's totally a pretty agree. brutal assessment of, of parents and parenting in general. Yeah. Because it's, to have, you know, to have children, that's a big commitment. And, mm-hmm. and I'm sure every child is ho- hopefully brought into the world with love and all that, you know. So her her broad uh, scathing indictment of all parents or that your heart dies when you get older, it's almost like a Peter Pan complex of, you know, when you're young, you're innocent and everything about you is pure. Yeah. When you become older, you become jaded. And is some of that true? Absolutely. You do become a little jaded because you, you, you experience life. But that doesn't mean you're like the most awful thing in the world. Right. So I it's kind of like, you know, and so some of those, that, that, those were some of the things that didn't hit to me, hit me too good. And then there was just a lot of like sexual talk, like let's impregnate the prom queen. I'm like, that's not going to play too well now anymore. Like that kind of stuff just <laughs> does it like, well, like no, it was, cr- it was no. cringy. It was cringy when I was no. watching it now. Yeah. I- I, well, I mean, but kids do talk like that. I mean, I, yeah, but I, I, I see what you're saying. It would never play like now, but interestingly enough, there is going back to uh, some of the characters, how they would see, how would be, they would seem today. There's an interesting little feature on um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Criterion's uh, Blu-ray edition of, of the movie has a little feature where Molly Ringwald was being interviewed on NPR and she was basically saying that she watched the, the film with her daughter and she had a totally different perspective on, you know, what, what her character <laughs> was. And, and it was like, and she was cringing out. She was like, Ooh, this is, you know, so, um, so that, that's an interesting interview. If, you, if, if anybody's, you know, if you ever get a chance to pick that up and check that out, that's a, it's a really interesting feature. Yeah. Um, I think, and, and I think that might that might hit it is if if you're of the age when you I think you have to see this when you're that age because I think there are some universal themes where everybody thinks that their parents don't understand them in in one aspect or another mm-hmm. or there are, there are aspects of your personality when you're young that parents don't get and they they see you as one thing uh, so I think this is very important to see it at that age right because I, I think you I, I think it's very identifiable. So even though the the characters have the common theme, because they're different types of characters, you can then identify with the one that does sports, or you can identify the what the one that doesn't do sports that's more academic, and you can identify with this other one. So so in one aspect it's it's very one note, but in the mm-hmm. other hand, you're able to find one of those characters that you identify with and can slot in with on on this in this movie. But I really think you have to be in that age because because they they are right a little bit. You, you get you do get jaded, and as an adult, when you're I'm looking at it now, I'm like, oh my god, these kids are just like, come on, <laughs> you know. It's like I'm no, sure I, most of us would kind of would <clears throat> kill to go back to being that age when mm-hmm. when the, those were the biggest problems generally. So and it's like that for every generation. So it's never yeah. it's really never going to change. So this movie, uh, if you were to ask, you know, does it hold up? Um, what do you think? It, I think it holds up only in the aspect. I mean, if if you look at it from the point of view of the parents, I mean, of, co- of course, you know, they're from an older generation, so things were a little bit different for them maybe at the time when it's set in the '80s. But if every every generation is the same thing, that that social hierarchy is still there. It, it, it's yeah. it, that never changes. So yeah, I think you know my you know J- uh, my son Jacob could watch this movie and and, and relate to it. But and that's the thing, though, is, and you just you know. hit on it. <clears throat> you just hit on it. Is mm-hmm. is they have to be of that age? Yeah, I think because because watching it as an adult now, mm-hmm. I'm like, it hasn't aged, for me. It hasn't aged well because it's very heavy handed. Yeah the 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 gripes that the characters have again are, are very similar, and they're similar enough that it seems like okay, you're beating me over the head. Yes, we know all these kids have problems. We know they're you know, all tortured souls. Like it's so, so over the top with it Mm -hmm. that 
you got to be that age to get it. And you go, oh, they, they totally get me. And I get it because I was at that age and that's when it hit me. But watching it now, I'm like, oh, it's just like, you know, uh, head yeah, blood, just so, so heavy. And, 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 and the, the telling and not showing was, was a thing for me too. It's like they were just explaining about how bad their parents were. Maybe, you know, maybe so, if there was some type of a, a, a flash, I know this is not the film and, and it, the film takes place in a, in a, in a, in this space that it, they're in. Yeah. But it, it just became that very just – they're all describing. So they're all basically describing the same thing. So that is for me where it got to just, just to be like a one-note thing. And and this was – at this point after watching, I was like this is this was more of a, a nostalgia watch, watch for me. It it brings the characters together. You know, there's an understanding. But one does – you know, you have to wonder are they – you know, are they making this stuff up? We don't know to what level – what degrees that, you know, each situation is. I mean, it's yeah. just, well, the parents it, would say no. Exactly. Right. The parents I mean, would be, like, oh, just no, a, you're, you know, you're, miscommunication, misunderstanding, or you're crazy, which is what you're every parent parents. goes through because exactly. kids don't, they don't open up. I mean, I could relate to that. I'm a parent, you know, my, my kids that, you know, when they didn't feel like talking to me, they didn't. So, you know, is that are they building this stuff up? You know, just to make themselves heard. I think that's the, that's the whole point of the film for me is that they just want to be heard, and they finally have someone to listen to get those. You know, and to they came in perfect strangers. They walked away as the Breakfast Club. Are they going to be friends going forward? We don't know. We don't know. I'm going to say gonna no. Happen, you know, because I'm going to say no to that. But they'll I'm they will no. have different perspectives about each other though. You know, I hope so. You you hope so. It kind of yeah. leaves you with that, but it also it leaves you with it. yeah, <clears throat> with but, the reality of 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 Molly Ringwald's character saying, "Yeah, no, I'm not going to say hi to you. I'm not mm-hmm. going to talk to you." And and there was only two characters that agreed that they would is is Brian Anthony Michael Hall and Ali Sheedy. They're like, "Yeah, I, I would, I would." Mm-hmm. And and again, it got so mean. She goes, "Well, that's because you look up to us." So it's just so like still they're still going in on each other after yeah. after all that 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 sharing of, of everything and all they've been through, they're, they're still going in on each other. And that's kind of there. She's just as bad as, as his parent then at that point. Sure. You know, cause yeah, you look up to me and he's, he's like, you're so full of yourself and, and all that, that, you know, so I, I don't, I don't know. I, so you know, it, but the thing is, that's what good, that's to me, it, you know, it's real makes it that much more realistic to me. And I think a lot of good cinema should do that. You know, you, you should, you know, look at a film and, you know, you kind of put yourself in a bubble and it's, it's more of a personal thing, not really think about how the, how the audience is going to react, but yourself. And it's okay to feel a little unsettled by it, a little disturbed by it. No, I don't agree with this because it's not, it's not made for just entertainment value. It's really, you know, just to get in there and to kind of, you know, point these things out. So for me, okay. it's, it, so, I think it holds up better for me than I think you um, in that in that sense. So I, I kind of get some, you know, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, I, I also like to think that I agree with the the sort of heavy handedness of it. But I think it was a necessity for this film because that's really the mm-hmm. point of the film is to, you know, get okay. these kids together and to kind of, you know, get these things addressed. And they really needed that to bounce this stuff off each other in order to feel what alive to relate, whatever it is, they, 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 you know, they needed to get it out. So obviously they couldn't talk to their parents about it. So it is kind of like a therapy session with no therapist. <laughs> they're, they're the therapist themselves, yeah. but you know, but they're also tearing into each other and they keep it real by saying, yeah, I'm not going to talk to you on Monday. I, I doubt it. Cause that's the reality of it, yeah. you know, cause that probably would be the case, you know? So <clears throat> yeah, it's just yeah. it was just a lot. I mean, you know, they they packed a lot into it, and I think that's yeah. that that's probably what makes it now. W- I, I was pretty happy with with the single watching. So let me let me let me put it to you this way. I'm gonna I'm gonna rattle off four titles. Okay, I'll, I'll do I'll do five titles. <laughs> okay, okay. Sixteen candles, the Breakfast Club. Pretty in Pink, Ferris Bueller, and some kind of wonderful. Which one are you going to watch more than once? Or which one are you only going to watch once? I would probably watch The Breakfast Club, to be honest with you. 
Because out of those five, you would pick the Breakfast Club. Because I can't personally. I can't stand yeah. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Really? I hate that movie. Wow. I cannot. I cannot abide. Oh. I, I just there's something about mm. that film. Shots uh, fired. Shots fired. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I just that's one. That's one of his movies I could never stand because I okay. I can't stand him and Matthew Broderick in that film. <laughs> Okay. Mm. That that wouldn't be that wouldn't you be know. my number one either. <clears throat> I, I love Ferris Bueller, and 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 when I saw that one two years later, that one was everything. I was like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing, and this is like the antithesis to it, and this is the other side of of you know the parents were played as dopes in that one, exactly, and, and the and the, and the character was smarter than everybody in the room, but, but exactly. that's the way it was played. But it wasn't played as him being serious as serious. It was it was such a parody. Yeah. For me, I, some kind of wonderful. I think for me is is the the John Hughes film that's the most fully realized. Well, that's the one I haven't seen. It's some kind of wonderful. So I really can't speak to it because it's been a long time since I've seen that one. I think I probably only saw it once or twice. I, yeah. I remember seeing it in the theater. Uh, Eric Stoltz. Really? Yeah, I saw it once in the theater, and I remember. Um, I caught it after, like on VHS, probably on cable rental. or something like that. Yeah. I rented um, it from RKO Video. <laughs> Ooh, but yeah, I, think, I mean, but Breakfast Club, I could, I could revisit, I could watch it, you know. And there, there are certain, and there are those little entertainment value. There is entertainment value to it. When you, oh, there absolutely is, and, and, and there's the soundtrack. It, I mean, it, you've, it's you've an got, easy watch, but it's, but it's also an, uh, an intense watch at the same time. So you kind of get the both, best of, blah, blah, the best of both worlds there, you know. Yeah, it doesn't. Yes, it doesn't so. hurt that you had simple minds in there too. No, um, with don't you? But and I bought the soundtrack when it came out, and, and really, the, I bought it for two songs, and it's the two songs that are highlighted in the film. Yeah. Is don't you forget about me, which was a monster hit back then, and that mm -hmm. kind of really just put simple minds. It, it put simple minds on the map, but I, I, it certainly didn't hurt the film. I the song I actually like better is Wang Chung, Fire in the Twilight. Yes. That's the song when they're yeah. running through the halls. Yes, yes. I love, I I remember when I bought the song, I was like, oh my God, that was the song that I really loved because I was a Wang Chung fan uh, separate. So I was kind of like, that was good. But that's just a great song. It's just, mm -hmm. and, and it fits the it fits the action, the, the, the tempo of it, fits fits where it's used in the movie. So I, I really dug that. And, and, yeah. and it's funny because John Hughes, like he really also tied the music in. It was such an important part of using those contemporary artists of the time to on the soundtrack. So it it did it did also make it of its time because he was using like Wang Chung and he would use psychedelic furs for Pretty in Pink and yeah. uh, you know OMD you know if you leave so all those. Yeah. Those so a lot of those iconic eighty songs were also tied to a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these films from John Hughes that that he he was able to use the artists of the day also. So does it date it a little bit? Sure, but they're they're great songs. So they're not cheesy songs. They're they're songs that that fit. Um, it's and a I time think Wang Chung, Wang Chung is is yeah. under is probably undersold. No one probably knows that song. Everyone knows Pretty in Pink. Everyone yeah. knows If You Leave and, and Don't You Forget About Me. So I'm gonna always go with the underdog. I I have to go with Wang Chung. I mean, everybody, Wang yeah. Chung tonight. Gotcha. <laughs> right? I mean, we have yep. to tonight. We have to. <laughs> have fun tonight and then Wang Chung tonight. That's where I stand on it. Okay. Keith Forsey was the producer. I think the music, I think he compiled yeah. the music. Yeah, and they offered it to producer. Billy Idol. He was working, yeah. he was working with Billy, Billy Idol. Idol. Yep. <clears throat> uh, producer. So they offered a, they offered a lot of people some some spots on this soundtrack and, and no one was was picking on it. And uh, they offered Simple Minds, and, and Simple Minds actually declined. They're like, eh, we, we write our own songs. We don't do that. We don't do music that other people wrote. Um, eventually, they got them to do it, which was good, good on them because that made them. That, that's, that that's set right. them up to, to then have a, a, have a decent career because they had some really good songs after that, Simple Minds. Wang Chung kind of didn't, didn't cash in on it as much. They had like one album after um, Everybody Have Fun Tonight, which I love that song. So that was their big one, um, but that was that was pretty much how it was back then. The, the music was so tied to those teen movies, even even not not the John Hughes movies, but but all those movies, all those teen movies had like music in them. Yeah, you know, even even one like this that's a really heavy drama. There was some opportunity to put put a little dynamic music to get you moving in there, and then they went back to you know when they got back to those other 
those other hard scenes and those tough scenes, it was quiet. There's no other music. It's not like there's a score going on here. No, it's, there it's isn't one of those any silence. To speak kind of, of kind of like yeah. kind of like Twelve Angry Men. It's kind of like there's no music. There's no there's no cues to tell you to that that there's some tension coming. It's just it's just there on the page. It's there for the actors, and they and they did have a tough job. I mean, it well well done for for an ensemble like this because you really have to when you're going to deal with material like this, you have to come correct. Yeah. You know, you have to. Probably so, the only two cues that they used, like pieces of music, was with Bender. When he when he flipped out about telling about his home life, and then he starts flipping out, and you hear this like real intense kind of sh- 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 like music going on. And then of course the the scene where in the closet. There's a little bit of that sort of tension music like happening, like just underscoring what was going on. It's it's not much, but it's it's there. So it really makes that scene more, more palpable and, you know, intense. So, <clears throat> but yeah. So, so for you, the definitive high school film? Um, only in the sense that, you know, I, I, I felt like I knew these kids. I honestly felt like the, the it was, there was a truth to them and the, 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 uh, the there was uh, their performances. And I, I felt like I, I actually went to high school with these kids. You know, a lot of other movies you don't, it, there's, it's like a goof fest. It's, you know, there are kids you may relate to, may not, but for the most well, part, that's it's all what I was going to ask you. It's all about partying. It's all about, you know, trying to get the that's girl. That's where I was going. Yeah. So, and is yeah, this, is this, there was is that this too. More, <clears throat> is this more or less iconic than Fast Times at Ridgemont High? Which film is more iconic? I think Fast Times is more iconic. You know, that's, then you got movies like Days and Confused even in the 90s, which, you know, I, I, that that might be one we could talk about. You know, a little further down the road too. That'd be interesting when we talk. I didn't about even think music about that. When and, I think of yeah, <clears throat> when I think of high school films, I think of films in the eighties, like mm-hmm. this stuff. I think of the yeah. like you can't help but well, think that was of our, the John U stuff. And, and you said like Por- Porky's, which is a high school film. Uh, Revenge of the Nerds, which is hysterical, <laughs> but it's still a yeah, high that school. One, film. That that's one. actually a college. That's actually a college film. That's a college film. Mm-hmm. I digress. So that would be with Animal House. Uh, in, in that conversation, but yeah, Dazed and Confused is that might be the definitive high school film. Could be, yeah. I think I think it might be. I think it's. I think that's. Yeah, that, that might be it. Okay. Yeah, but like I said, I mean, with, with Breakfast Club, though, it's like I, I actually feel like I mean, they they were of the right age. These kids were cast, and some of these other films are a little bit old. You know, the actors are a little bit older. So they're not really high school kids or, you know, in this case, yeah. I think. Well, Judd Nelson know, was pushing 25. Okay. Well, <laughs> he, he played, well, maybe he got left back so many times, you know, maybe <laughs> well, he that, was 25. That, you know what? <laughs> and that's about par for that character is, you know, yeah. you're going to be here. And, and this way, if he, if he never leaves, that means, you know, Paul Gleason can't go after him after he gets out of school. Right. You know, if he's always, if he, if he just keeps staying, he's never going to get, you know, he's never going to get beat up. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe Paul Gleason will retire and then kind of right off into the sunset into a teacher's retirement home. Then he can go ahead and graduate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, so th- that's, I, I think, you know, like I said, I, I, I kind of came to it with, with the memories I had. And I and I I have become my parents. I guess uh, I guess the, their 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 prophecy was correct because I am a little bit more jaded about the film than I used to be, and I and it's not one that I watch all that often. So I was still c- clinging to the memories of of when I first saw it and that impact that it had on me of that age. So I, I'm definitely going to go with to, to kind of wrap it up. Is yes, this film needs to be seen absolutely. And and if you, I guess if you're a parent, you might want to show it if you've got a kid of that, a child of that age, um, or if you're listening and you're of this of that age, check out this film because you will identify with it. I, I think those you you're right, those will. yeah, th- those theme those themes are universal. They don't change. You know, decades may change and, and technology may change, but I think social uh, interactions in school and social where people land socially. And what people, how people classify each other in in, in school, I don't think that changes. Mm-hmm. I think that's always there. So those are universal things for young people, it, and everybody at some point feels like, do I fit in? Even when you are fitting in, because that that's what this film deals with is people that that don't fit in, people that are assumed to fit in, 
right? Like the sport guy and, and you know, Claire, they're, everyone else assumes, well, they just fit in and they've got a perfect life and, and they don't. So I think that's where it's what it's important is it really illustrates that everybody has has these types of problems. Yeah. And we don't, again, we, we don't, it is a more sort of one-sided view, but I think it's important to, as a, as a parent, to show it to kids. And this is, I mean, we might've felt this way back in the day, but now, you know, here's what I'm feeling now. So it's, it, it's important that you can actually sit down with your kids and you can discuss these kinds of things. Now it's, it's in it, it, using this as a vehicle to kind of open that dialogue, I think, which is, is, and I think the movie is, is a perfect, uh, is perfect for that. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and again, John Hughes was just hitting it. I mean, he just, I don't know how he was tapping into this. Um, he, he was just uh, kind of like just a genius. I mean, with the stuff mm-hmm. he was writing, you know, focusing, being able to focus in on, on the teenage experience and then also be able be able to write uncle buck and, and great outdoors and all these other films. So, you know, John Hughes, you, you got to hand it to him. Even even if you think you know Ferris Bueller is a misfire, it, it fits within within his canon of of teen films. Oh, absolutely. It, I, I there's mean, something it, there's something for everybody. If you pick if you pick those five or six films, you'll find something in at least two or three of them that you'll identify with. If you if you want the goofy or if you want the comedy, you go with Ferris Bueller. If you want the heavy, you, you go with yeah. Breakfast Club. You know, and you, and you'll be able to get it. And then and then the other stuff kind of falls in between. 16 candles is is more the comedic and then pretty in pink and and some kind of wonderful are are two sides of the same coin it's the same story basically just with the roles or re, the genders are reversed so you kind of get to see the flip side of it and and for my money just to to wrap that up is is for me some kind of wonderful really addresses all the stuff that he did before in in one little neat package and then that kind of that kind of closes out the stuff that he was writing at that point as far as those yeah. teen things he he did she's having a baby after that but that was about adulthood you know so he really yeah i like that one that's one so i think it's one of his more underrated because i actually really enjoyed that one yeah and, so. and he started to come that's mm-hmm. when he started to break away and then he started yeah. writing and then he would actually skip high school and go back to elementary school in 1990 with home alone and curl and then he wrote curly sue which is about younger dutch in 91 is about younger kids Dennis, he wrote the screenplay for Dennis the Menace. Uh, he actually went younger, so mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know what what the the story was behind that Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. He did the, he he did the you know wrote the remake for. Um, so he actually went really really family friendly and brought it brought the the teen angst like level really down, and and really went down to kind of uh, entertaining really the younger set. Yeah. So to wrap this up. The Breakfast Club is an absolute 80s classic of, of like I said, teenage angst. It, it's all there. It's a classic in, in the John Hughes teen film canon. It's a classic in, in teen films just in general. If you know the, the, the early to mid 80s was just ripe with those films because you had all those actors in there. So check out The Breakfast Club. You, you won't go wrong. Let us know how you feel about The Breakfast Club. Did you like it? What didn't you like about it? What other John use films did you like even better except for beethoven we're not going to talk about the beethoven movies (laughs) so on behalf of eric i'm dean thank you for joining us on the 3324 podcast and please be kind and rewind you've been listening to the 3324 podcast with dean legiro and eric cooper you can find us on your favorite podcast provider so please like subscribe and rate to become a part of the 3324 family Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 